Good morning. I'm not sure where we're going to stand. Where are you? Um, we are Kurt and Rochelle Zerberg, and it's a picture of our family, um, the four. Our oldest is an elementary art teacher in the local school districts in Zeeland, Ohio, where we, Ohio, Zeeland, Michigan, Zeeland, Ohio. <laughs> where we live. And then um, our second, Anna, is a senior at Cedarville University, and she's looking to be a math teacher. And then um, our third daughter is Sierra, and she's in. She's a sophomore, and um, she's looking forward to this opportunity to um, this summer care for children of missionary families who are coming for a conference, and so she's excited about that. Yeah, I think we'll we'll be in Thailand. For yes, <clears throat> and, um, and then our son Elijah is in seventh grade. And um, he's kind of a little entrepreneur. He's going to take on some lawn mowing this summer. <clears throat> There's a story with each one of the things that she mentioned there, but we won't go there. Um, so you can go to the next slide. We were missionaries for 16 years, two years in southern Russia, so that we could learn Russian, because the city that we were in was Odessa of Ukraine. You see it's up on the map there. And we were in Ukraine for 14 years. And we say that we, we did church planting, and, and often people are like, oh, church planting well, is such a broad uh, word in lots of ways. But what we did is we boiled it down to we just used the talents and interests and gifts that God gave us to get to know people, serve people, love on people, grow friendships, and introduce them to Jesus as best as possible. And we got the, the privilege of seeing a small church start to grow. And it was just a really, really special time. We'll um, come back to a little bit later. We're not in Ukraine, actually right now, obviously. But uh, also, we have not been in Ukraine for the last three years. So we'll, I'll tell a little bit more about that in a minute. But Rochelle's going to share one story about a special lady that we've known th throughout the years. So this picture. The next picture. Um, is Ludmila and our teammate, Amanda. And Ludmila, um, we pretty much got to know when we first arrived in Odessa. And, um, Can I say a fun fact? She's a former rocket scientist. I mean, how many times do you get to see a, a USSR former rocket scientist? I don't know. So, just sort of fun. Um, and um, she's a dear gal in our hearts. Um, she uh, spent a lot of time around our table. And in the beginning years of our being there, um, came to know Jesus as her Savior, and then began to just grow in that love for the Lord. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, sorry, there's so many stories that are running through my brain <laughs> over Ludmila. Um, so when we had to um, leave three years ago, we, it was a sad time for all of us, um, and so we really just entrusted all the things that would take place um, in Ukraine to the Lord. And as you know, it, of course, the war came, and um, the Lord has uh, equipped Ludmila to reach out to um, neighboring people who need, have medical needs and she goes and finds out what kind of medication she needs and they need. And then she goes and purchases it and brings it back. And usually she brings along a couple young gals with her to um, just to do the ministry together. And, um, and then prays with the, the people that she interacts with. And uh, there's a number of us who support her to have the money to be able to do that. And... Recently, I was informed that she now, with two other ladies on Fridays, goes to what we would consider like a veterans hospital to interact with the wounded soldiers and to hear their stories and to pray with them and just to be a bright. Um, so it's, um, and she told this gal who was conveying the story to me that she understood that um, we needed to step out so that the Lord would raise her up. 
and it's an mm. amazing thing to think about um, how he is working. Yeah, and Ludmilla says, I was made for this. Yeah, so um, I did allude to the fact that we're, we're no longer in Ukraine. And so about five years ago, the Lord started nudging us towards uh, coming back to the States. And it was really a confusing time for us because we had gone through all the blood, sweat, and tears of learning language, culture, growing friends, which is really hard in that setting. It's really slow. And we saw just beautiful friendships and beautiful growth and ministry, just, yeah, a lot of the good, good things. And then he starts nudging us to come back home. And we didn't even know why. We didn't know we, were, we weren't moving to anything. And, and it was just a really disorienting time. Our Ukrainian church and our supporting churches were supportive of it. We returned back to the States not knowing what we were going to do and just asking the Lord. And he led us into something that we saw that he had for us in advance. And it's a ministry, we call it Soul Care. And it is walking with missionaries and pastors in that journey of just giving a safe space for people to unpack their walk with the Lord. People did that for us while we were overseas and gave us, it gave us the strength to continue on. And so now we get to do that for others, knowing what that journey is like. On the next slide is a few um, kind of things of descriptions of soul care, uh, refreshing the heart of those who serve so they can experience faith, um, fruitfulness in their lives and ministries. Um, and also, soul care examines how a person actually relates. Really helps them. We uh, walk with them in their awareness of how they are interacting with God, really relating to Him, and um, and the Lord meets them, and um, so that He can meet them where they have a great need. <clears throat> and then soul care is also scripture filled shaped care that assists people in their communication with God. It's a very beautiful um, walk to journey with someone as they um, interact with how God is speaking to them and meeting a, a heart-filled need of theirs. Um, and soul care is an investment in helping missionaries and pastors succeed in their calling. We thought we'd read a couple testimonies for some people just to get a sense of what it is. One guy described it this way, when a wet spot appears in your wall, you know that there is a leak deeper inside the wall, hidden from obvious view. By the time you see the wet spot, it's already too late. Having someone available in whom I have deep trust helps me discover things wrong in my soul before they begin to leak. At the same time, having soul care allows me to discover things which are going well in my life without feeling prideful. This is not just another accountability partner to whom I report. This is someone who helps me discover the deeper relationship that I have with God by listening and asking the right questions. Another testimony, and we share these because, um, you know, what we, they share is confidential. But this does, these are people who wanted to be able to give you a, a, a little window into um, what they, how meaningful it is for them. So it's an important to note that soul care takes time, patience, in the art of listening, learning to listen to someone's heart and grieve with them without trying to give advice or fix it can be very challenging. Um, she repeats, I'm very thankful for this ministry and how, how I wish I had known about soul care nine years ago when it seemed my world was falling apart. I cannot overemphasize what a wonderful ministry this is. And then one other guy writes, I wish I would have been connected to someone like you prior to leaving for overseas. It's been so refreshing to be able to openly and honestly and safely work through such important issues with someone like you who understands and cares. Your guidance and care have been invaluable for me in growing in my emotional and spiritual health to the tune of better enriching my relationship with family, friends, fellow brothers and sisters, and most importantly, God. I just got turned off. <laughs> so, um, we just want to say thank you. I don't. We don't know many of you very well. We've been the last time we were here. I think I was lighting something on fire that shot across the sanctuary. But um, that's another story. But uh, we're just so thankful. We have. Um, 
It's hard to express how thankful we are to have the privilege and the joy to be able to do what we do. And we can't do those things without, without your support and partnership with us. And it's, it's, it, we're thankful, and it's also really sort of strange and humbling in a sense. It's like, really? We're like, sort of like we tell God, like, we really get to do this? And, we, and we've been saying that for the last 20 years. It's just such a privilege, and so thank you so much. Thank you. Well, now I get to be up here alone. I don't like being alone, but that's all right. We'll, we'll get through this. So we're going to talk about wrestling with God today. And I just wonder as we get started, how many times have you been to Sunday morning church service? You don't have to raise your hand with numbers, but maybe it's your first time ever. Or maybe it's so common that to not go on a Sunday morning would feel really strange. But either way, I'm just wondering, how are you coming to our gathering today? What might be stirring in your soul? And we're actually going to provide a little space right now, just a little bit of quiet. You can close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to close your eyes, but just a few moments of quiet, just to wonder that question, what is stirring in your soul? And as you begin to notice, maybe take a moment to share this silently with the Lord. He sees you and he hears you. Father, thank you that you're with us. Thank you that we can come to you as we are in our honesty and struggles. I just ask that you would help us to notice, notice you in this time. Amen. God delights in seeing and hearing you as you are. The real you relating with a real God who is really present with you today. So what did you notice as we paused? Maybe you noticed how uncomfortable silence was. I sit with many people who are very uncomfortable with silence. Maybe you notice how much you crave silence and stillness. Maybe you just want to get home and get on with your day if you're honest. Did you notice any shoulds or shouldn'ts? Something like, I shouldn't be feeling this way, or I should be on this struggle, I should be beyond this struggle by now. God delights in our honesty with ourselves, with others, and with him. A little bit about my story about a year ago, I took a season of my time with the Lord in the morning was the first part of the time was to just notice what was stirring in my soul and just ask that question, what's going on? What's going on in my soul right now? And I wrote it down, not a lot, and, and then I would read back through it for the week. And I had a theme that came up. I noticed that I was anxious often. And then another theme, I noticed that I didn't like that about myself. So I was getting anxious about my anxiety. I'm like, this is not a good spiral to go down. But that was just what I was noticing. And the beautiful part of that story 
was that as I honestly expressed that to God on a regular basis, I found him meeting me and loving me in my anxiety. And he was bringing me back to peace and calm and a place of feeling settled. And this wrestle is not done. It still continues. I'm so surprised to see how often my anxiety sneaks into my soul and how often I need to once again hear God's loving words spoken over me as he calls me his beloved. This process of noticing my anxiety, expressing this to God and to others, and receiving his words of love for me once again, this brings me peace and comfort. And maybe I call it a sort of a rest for my soul. It's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing wrestle with the real love of God with my real struggles. And today we're going to talk about wrestling. One sweet memory I have with each of my kids is when they were younger, we loved to wrestle. They would jump and climb on me as I was the bucking horse on the ground and trying to throw them off. Or we played this thing called Clippy Whippy where I'd sit on the couch and they would try to get a little a clip or something or whatever I had behind my back. And we would wrestle and laugh and there was so much energy and fun. And even when we talk about that now to this day, there are sweet memories and a big smile comes through our face. And today we're going to enter the story of another wrestling match. And this one is not light-heart, lighthearted like the one with my kids at all. It's much more intense, and it's very personal. It's the story of Jacob. And we could call Jacob the wrestler. I think that would be a good description of him. We see Jacob born to Isaac and Rebekah, and he's a twin. His brother is Esau. And we see right at birth, he's even a wrestler. It says in Genesis 25 that he came out grasping Esau's heel. Now, they could have said came out holding his heel, could be out nudging his way out just behind Esau, but he came out grasping. That word sounds like a wrestling to me. And what about his name, Jacob? You know what Jacob means? It means deceiver. I don't know about you, but if I was called the deceiver, I would be wrestling from the get-go. Why am I called the deceiver? And then he was a deceiver. So you wonder, what was he wrestling with? Wrestling with being noticed? Wrestling with having something that he couldn't have? I don't know. We can't answer all those questions. We see when it, it, w- w- there was a time when, e- when he bribed Esau for his birthright with food. Esau comes in ravishing hungry. Jacob's like, I got some food, but birthright first, man. And Esau gave it over, gave it up. And then later on, with the help of his mom, he deceives Isaac, the dad, his dad, to get his brother's blessing. That was a big, big deal. And then soon after, because he was in trouble, Esau wanted to kill him. Then Jacob leaves the home to find a wife with his relative's family, Uncle Laban. And on the way, when he leaves, heading towards Laban's, something curious happens. And we pick this up where Jacob has a dream at Bethel. I'm going to read that. So Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. I'm going to stop a second. Try to enter into this story. Don't just take it in as like information. Well, here's here, here's the. Like, if you need to close your eyes and just like, what would this be like to be Jacob? Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. First thing, that is not a good pillow. I mean, if you really take this. You know, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. 
This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the, the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And, all of, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So just that's a little window into his travels. And then he gets to Uncle Laban's and he tries to marry Rachel. That doesn't go well because he accidentally marries Leah. That's a curious story to read. But he worked for seven years to be able to marry Leah. And then he worked another seven years to marry Rachel. And then after that, they had lots and lots of kids. And after that, lots and lots of animals that they raised. And there are lots and lots of struggles. 20 years of struggle. Jacob then finally leaves Uncle Laban, and he doesn't just leave, he actually escapes. It looks like an escape plan when he's heading out. And, and now he's with his grown family, his grown extended family. They're on the run, heading back to Israel, to, to the land, uh, his homeland. And Jacob is almost back to his homeland, and here is where we pick up his story in a little bit more detail. We go to the next, next one where Jacob wrestles with God. Again, entered this story. Imagine yourself like right there watching what's going on. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his female servants, and, and his eleven sons and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of his hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then the, man, then the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not, Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was, hip was touched near the tendon. <clears throat> This was the night that Jacob wrestled with God himself. Can you imagine what was that was like to, to wrestle with God? At what point, I have so many questions. When, if you entered the story, I'm like, yeah, but what about, yeah, but. What, like, how about, at what point did he realize with whom he was wrestling, right? At some point, he realized, I'm wrestling with somebody other than a man. I'm wrestling with God. Because he says, I came face to face with God himself, right? And... Why didn't he give up when he realized this? He kept going. I mean, wrestling with God, seriously? Isn't it a bit odd, also, that God allowed Jacob to wrestle with him for the entire night? Our all-powerful God could have simply stopped the match within seconds. You're done. Yet, for some reason, God and Jacob wrestled all night. And we can wonder if this wrestle with God was not just physical, because 20 years ago, God said that he would bless Jacob like we read. But so far, Jacob has had 20 years of struggle and pain. You could almost hear him wrestling possibly with the question, God, where is the blessing you promised? Why all of this struggle? Why all this pain? And then God does something very significant in Jacob's life. God gave Jacob a new name. The name that would become the name of his chosen people, Israel. It's curious when we read what Israel means. Israel means wrestles with God. 
of all the names that God could have chosen for his chosen people, God chose to have his people be known as the ones who wrestle or struggle with him. That says something. Could this mean that as followers of God, we are invited to wrestle with him? To lean in close with our tough questions? To struggle with not seeing clearly? To hold fast to him as we face our fears and pain? To continue to walk baby steps in the darkness, longing for a glimmer of his light to glide away? It seems to be true that God invites us to wrestle with him because he could have remained distant to a broken, struggling, questioned world. Instead, he entered and engaged in a personal way. He came as Jesus, also named Emmanuel, which means God with us. Our God who wrestles with us. So where might you find yourself wrestling with God today? We all wrestle. Maybe you're facing an unexpected loss and struggling with why God would you allow such a tragedy. It doesn't make sense. Maybe you find yourself wrestling with knowing God's leading in your life. Maybe you're wrestling with feeling empty when you try to spend time with him. Or maybe you're in a season of peace. There have been wrestles in the past. There will be wrestles in the future. But for now, you're in a season of calm. Honestly, following God is challenging. We don't directly see him. We don't directly hear him speaking. And yet he leads us as we struggle to follow him. Sometimes it seems so clear, and other times we feel left in a fog. We cling to him through his written word and the church as we struggle to live out the uncertain details. Who to date or marry, when to give and when to save, when to rest and how much to work, when to be silent and when to speak out. I remember one of, the, one of my many big wrestles I had in Ukraine between God and I was specifically I'd worked really hard for seven years to develop a small-scale community-based recycling program. And it's, I could tell hours and hours of stories of how God led us into it, blessed us in it. It was really amazing, and I loved it. I loved it. The ministry to the people of the city was working and flowing, and, God, and finally God even provided a short-termer to come help me for a year. I was doing this on my own, and I needed help, and, and finally one's coming. And then, just before the short-termer got there, <laughs> oh, it seemed like God was clearly, say, clearly saying to me to begin shutting down the program. What? <laughs> that was my first question. After all that you led me through, that was really hard. I liked what I was doing, and it was going well, and it was working. There were so many hurdles that God led us and carried us through to get to where we were at the time. And, and what was I supposed to do now with this short-termer who was coming for an entire year to help me in the recycling project? Yet with the help of a listening friend, I knew that God was leading me to slowly shut things down. And I say slowly mostly because I was dragging my feet to be sure. Sure, in quotes. And I felt so empty I felt really confused, torn, sad, at times very numb. What was I supposed to do now? I didn't like the thought of stillness at all because stillness felt like failure to me. I had so many more questions and doubts. And what about, and it was really hard. Looking back now, I can say that I think God's intent was to slow me down so that I could take another step into leaning into his deep love for me that wasn't connected to my performance, and that he had me on a course of seeing how much I love myself based on my performance as well. There was, a, there was a lot of shame behind my activity. I wanted to like myself based on my abilities. And funny how this struggle stuck around, because I thought that I was free of that wrestle for good when I stepped out of playing college soccer 20 years ago. But yet, 20 years later, I was, still, I was still wrestling. And honestly, I am still wrestling. I can say that I am more aware of this wrestle 
and I am noticing the goodness, the kindness, and the gentleness of God in a way that I didn't notice and experience as much before. I notice how comforting it is to hear again and again that he calls me his own. He calms me as he gently reminds me again that he values me as his child. So what is the wrestle you might be having with God during this season of your life? Where might you be keeping God or others or even your own self at arm's length? And as you wrestle with him, do you notice how you imagine God's posture towards you? Often we struggle with some picture of God that, that goes something like this. God is up there someplace too busy to take time to attend to me. And why would he anyhow? I'm not that important in his big plan anyway. Or God has his arms perpetually folded with his back facing you because he is either uninterested or always at least slightly disappointed in you as he wonders when you might get your act together. And when, and when you have, for those little moments of having your act together, he's like, finally. Maybe this is your wrestle. Oh, just so you know, those postures are not accurate posture, um, images of who God really is. But we often honestly hold those postures, those images about God. Or maybe your wrestle, as you read and hear the passage, is about the depth of God's love for you. But the image of God that keeps popping up in your heart is much less engaged less interested, less gentle, and less kind. If this is you, then how might God be inviting you to wrestle with him as he calls you his beloved, whom he loves with a deep... <laughs> yeah. With a deep, unending, everlasting love. If you find yourself wrestling with God, then you're not alone. We all wrestle with God in one season or another, in one way or another. It's not a one and done thing. Wrestling is, a what, a, is what is a, a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if you're worried about, man, this is just Kurt's idea, the Bible is full of wrestling. I just wrote down a couple, couple references we're not even going to look at. Jacob is one, but Moses wrestling with God, Jonah, Job, Gideon, the disciples, the woman at the well, Mary, Martha, Nicodemus, Paul, the list is really, really long. Throughout the Bible, we can see that God's people, the ones who are following him, are people who wrestle with him. Maybe your wrestle this season is not one of discerning God's leading or struggling with his love. Maybe you're wrestling with a tale of two loves. Maybe God is gently revealing to you how much you find satisfaction and enjoyment in one of his good gifts to you. Your job, your family, your home, your talents, your friends, your things. And gradually, you have found yourself more passionate about the gift than the giver of that gift. Maybe you've noticed the fading of your love for God that once burned bright. Maybe you wonder, where has he gone? Or, where have I gone? Or, how did I get this busy? Or maybe you're outright wrestling with sin that you know is not beneficial to anyone, including yourself, but for some reason you continue on. Hear and notice this invitation from the Lord in Isaiah 1. So God says to the Israelites here, who had been really walking down a sinful road, he says, stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. 
Learn to do what's right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your, skins are, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now notice what God does not say in that, in that verse, that passage. He doesn't hate you in your sin or ignore you with the silent treatment. He hates what sin is doing to you. Notice what he is saying. God is gently, firmly, and compassionately inviting you to himself. He truly wants good things for you and desires and knows how to give this to you. When you are willing to bring your sin to light and pursue him and his goodness, God doesn't say get yourself cleaned up and finally maybe we can salvage something out of that mess we call your life. God whispers to you, dear one, pay attention to where you are. And he invites you to lean into him with your honest confession, questions, fears, unknowns, disappointments and struggles and brokenness. He can handle and actually delights in your honesty. He loves you more deeply than you'll ever know. As someone once put it, I wrestle with God and I hope to lose. And in all of our wrestling, God has never called us to walk alone. That's the second paper clip, clip I've dropped so far. I got one more, so I'll just get it over with. Okay. <laughs> and in all of our wrestling, God has never called us to walk alone. We are all made to be known and know one another. But since the time of Adam and Eve, we have been hiding from God, one another, and ourselves. Shame, the fear of someone not enjoying our presence because of something deeply wrong with us, keeps us in the dark. Shame tells us, maybe I'm the only one struggling with these questions. Or maybe no one is interested in listening to my wrestle. That's not true. We all wrestle. We all struggle. We have been made for and deeply need close friends who are willing to walk with us for the long haul and who are able to hold our struggles with God and others and ourselves as he heals us while somehow, somehow holding on to hope with us. A hopefulness that we will get through this together. Friends who say, I'm not going anywhere or giving up on you, and neither is God. We all long for and need friends like this. Yet personally, I find it's hard for me in two areas of friends. It's hard to make space in my life for growing friendships, and it's hard to invite and offer depth to these friendships by both listening well to their struggles and being willing to share my struggles with them. In this place of knowing and being known, we can find freedom to name without shame or denial the darker motivations of our lives and how mixed they are. And it is in these honest places when God does his transformative healing work. So what does your soul need today? Often the most challenging part of this answer is the beginning invitation to pay attention to our soul. How is your soul today? What might you be wrestling with God? And what might it look like to pay attention to this wrestle in the presence of God and in the presence of others? We're going to just take a few closing moments to notice and reflect and engage with God. You can close your eyes right now in silent prayer. Just a few moments to be quiet and still and notice. How is my soul today? What is stirring within me?
Thank you, God, that you wrestle with us and for us with a heart of love. Help us to continue to lean in. Amen. And now the God who loves you says to you in Romans 8, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord.